Hi, I'm Eddie Sunderji, and welcome to your finance TV's Crypto Revolution, covering all things crypto and digital assets. I got you with that one, Adam. Um, there is always lots to talk about in the world of crypto. Adam, welcome back, mate. Hey, Mehdi, good to see you. I'm uh, on location today. And where would location be? Location today is uh, Austin, Texas. I'm at an Airbnb. As you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Austin, Texas, being a third generation Longhorn myself. So uh, good to be here. I'm actually speaking at the CBOE, Chicago Board of Options Ex Exchange Risk Conference today, talking about the investment theses for Bitcoin and ETH. Oh, so you and Larry Fink will be uh, on the same page, I'm assuming. I totally assume they're going to throw us on a panel together. And, and rightly so. So I look forward next week to getting some color from uh, some of your interactions from the CBOE conference. Certainly, I'll bring them. That'd be awesome. So uh, before we dive in, and I think there's a couple of few, there's a couple of headlines that have hit the tape this week. But uh, before we dive in, don't forget to like and subscribe to our content. We're 5,000 subscribers. So thank you very much for your support in following us. And of course, always feel free to drop us a line if you want us to explore any particular topics. But um, I think, Je um, Jeff, I'm, I'm losing my mind, Adam. I apologize. But Adam, I feel like this week we kind of have to kick off with some excitement. There was, uh, I, and it started in the week. Bitcoin prices, um, I believe, touched, you know, or just marginally topped the thirty thousand dollar mark. Um, apparently, on the, on the uh, approval of BlackRock's ETF, but that turned out to be a little bit fake, fake news. Um, on the old social media platform X, uh, well, the platform formerly known as Twitter. Um, did you see these these headlines coming out? Yeah, I I did see them, Eddie. I wonder how I saw those. <laughs> uh, I think I think you sent me a message Monday morning that the ETF was approved, and I got excited and immediately checked my charts and saw Bitcoin flying up. Went to X, formerly known as Twitter, to see. It literally filled up my timeline, my entire timeline, scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, ETF approved, ETF approved. Uh, and then what was it? Five, six minutes later, someone saying this has not been confirmed. And next thing we know, it was actually uh, fake news uh, that Cointelegraph, which is a, a, as they say, a crypto media, but it's just a media company put out. Uh, and I think they're kind of still investigating how that news got out. But as you said, uh, the, the, quote, news of the approval, even if it was by Cointelegraph and not really verified, uh, sent the price up to $30,000 in in virtually no time. Yeah, it was de definitely quite a move. And, you know, but that's that's actually got everyone, you know, the, the one thing that's come out of this, obviously we don't ever uh, you know, condone fake news and, and these types of moves because that's just not what we want in this market. But it has got people talking. I, I believe a Bloomberg ETF analyst came out raising the odds of approval of a spot BTF, Bitcoin ETF uh, by to be approved by the SEC to 90%. You know, so there's, there's more people who are, and I don't know where it comes from, there's, there's no smoke without fire and yada, 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 but you know, it, it's got people chatting again about it and it's brought that story front and centre, which I always take. I think it's great getting this back onto, uh, onto topic. And, uh, you know, at some point, Hopefully the SEC just says, you know what, let's just go with it, approve this thing. There's no reason for them not to. Right. That you you're precisely right. And some people have come out and said, look, that the fact that everyone totally believed it for a good five minutes and the price shot up tells us that the market's ready for this. The market wants this. Right. And and at some point, I, I think the the role of the SEC is kind of to give the market what they want. Um, and, and as you said, we know that sometime in January, I think you said the 10th or something is that drop dead date for ARC to be either approved or denied. It's the last of their 240 days since they applied. And so it seems kind of silly to wait that long. Although I'll tell you, Matty, you know, I, I've read some people have said this, you know, kind of fake news that got out there, ran the price up, caused, I think, 100 or $150 million in liquidations in the process on fake news is actually going to give the SEC a little bit more pause and actually give them a little more ammunition, I think, to wait a little while before they go and announcing just because it, it I mean, what they, what they will likely see is how easy it is to manipulate the price of Bitcoin just by a post on X 
manipulated the price by a couple thousand dollars, whether it was it was intentional or not, doesn't matter. It's the fact that the SEC is probably going to say that. Now, we, we could point and go, you could probably do the same thing for Tesla. You could probably do the same thing for Apple. But I think the thing is, there's not enough. There's more of a robust market there for you know, Apple and Tesla, there, there's more market makers in the middle. There's more people that can come in there and take it to where it doesn't jump up 20 or 30 or 40 percent on some sort of news like that. And I think that's what the SEC is going to look at and say, see, look how easy it was to manipulate the price. You're, you're talking about, yeah, absolutely right. And you're talking about $100 million, which in the equities market and these names like Tesla and Apple and, and Amazon and whatever it is, is, is just a drop in the ocean. The lack of liquidity does make this much more malleable for, uh, you know, nefarious players, if that's what was behind this. But it's, you know, it, I agree. It does give a little bit of ammunition to the SEC, but, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's a, a new asset class that's coming out. Liquidity isn't going to be there uh, on day one, and liquidity will come after they make these types of approvals. And you know, even um, I don't know where it came out. Was it uh, Bitwise? Bit, Bitwise was making a prediction that US spot BTFs one will be approved at some point, and when they are, within five years, there'll be about fifty-five billion in inflows. Now, grand scheme of things, not necessarily huge, another fifty-five billion dollars, but. You know, for an emerging asset class, that's quite a significant input of assets. Um, it, it's it's still not in the equity league by any shot, but it does show that people are taking things seriously. And even our friend, you know, we mentioned him earlier, Larry Fink, he was talking about some of the things going on on ge- geopolitical basis, and he threw in um, the likes of crypto as being a flight to safety. I'm not sure if he necessarily meant crypto in general, um, because I didn't see ApeCoin move on the back of it. But uh, you know, I I think he was probably just referring more more lightly to to the likes of Bitcoin as as you know, almost uh, uh, an inflationary hedge, like we've discussed in the past and such. So that's what he probably was referring to in his flight to safety, because he put gold in the same conversation as well. So, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Right. Well, the interesting that Larry Fink was talking about, uh, obviously, what's happening geopolitically, which which is horrible. You know, war is going on. We, we have all, all these things happening. And his flight to safety or included crypto. Right. That's really interesting. And, and I think, as you and I have talked about, that goes two ways. One is you can buy you can own something like Bitcoin as this. Uh, stable supply, right? There will, uh, we talked about this. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. And therefore, um, I might want to own it because I'm not sure what's happening with other currencies. If we start printing other fiat currencies to fund war or whatever, or oil prices go up, we, we're going to see inflation. And therefore, I, I might want to own Bitcoin. But I think there's another reason to own it. In And maybe uh, Larry Fink was alluding to this is people in some of those countries, some of those countries where there's war and terrorism and everything else going on are looking to own or looking to utilize crypto because they can't trust their banks necessarily. They can't trust their governments necessarily. And if they need to up and leave the country, they can do so with their crypto. They don't have to go to the bank and wait in line and get their money and transfer and everything. They can walk out with their crypto. So there's two reasons why crypto in this case ends up being the flight to safety. And I'm not sure if he intended both of those, but that's the way I read it. That's the way I'm going to choose to read it because that, that, that's what I like about it. I'm um, with you. And also, you know, I'm sure, you know, Larry's on the same page as us. And I feel happy calling him Larry because we're old friends. Um, yeah. But, you know, that we also saw the volatility, obviously, with what's going on in Israel and such. The shekel was, you know, it had a huge amount of volatility. So, you know, it does... Why wouldn't you take a portion of your savings and such and put it into something like Bitcoin, which you know is not being impacted by the volatility, or it certainly hasn't been thus far, by what's going on in your own country and region? You do manage to get out of the country and, and you've got your assets that you can convert anywhere in the world into local currency. So there's a lot to be said for you know this this whole platform and this asset class so you know hopefully it does help help people and, and the bigger picture is that people start seeing that how it can help especially in these types of situations um exactly. a, a, a couple of you know pseudo concerning not concern or negative 
headlines out there as well. You know, a New York Times had a um, was highlighting about Chinese Bitcoin miners in the US. They're kind of becoming a, a bit more under scrutiny because of national security threats. And obviously, there's a lot of geopolitical tension between the US and China kind of creeping up there as well in the background. But several miners were or mines were reported to have ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Then that again raises the proximity to critical US infrastructure because of the energy utilization and such. So do you think there's any real um basis to this these concerns or is it just you know more headline grabbing? Uh I'm going to say it's probably more headline grabbing from the New York Times. I know Microsoft had actually raised a, a point to say Look, these you know Chinese Bitcoin miners have come kind of into our space. They're not they're not far from a, uh, I think a Microsoft data center, and Microsoft is saying this could be a problem. We we don't need the you know anyone associated with the Chinese Communist government over here, you know, kind of on the network, on the grid, anything like that. I'm thinking it's probably the New York Times with you know headline grabbing. They've been doing that lately, and by lately I mean the last fifty years. So. I was about to say, it's, lately is quite a long timeline. Late, late, lately, well, in the, in the grand scheme of, of the world, it's it's lately. So lately, they've been doing a, a bit of headline grabbing. I have to imagine that the likes of Microsoft and the likes of the Air Force, which was also alluded to here, uh, and hopefully, you know, the groups like the NSA and CIA and everyone else probably has the capability to, you know, watch what's going on with these Chinese Bitcoin miners and ensure that they're not, you know, intercepting some sort of secrets that we have going on or, or assume that they don't have too much control over the energy grid in certain places or energy production or anything. And this is where, you know, in like in several cases, I just have to kind of go, all right, the, the you know, it, it, as much as we worry about them from a surveillance perspective, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, whomever, uh, probably is also looking. They're probably not reading the New York Times and going, man, we never thought of that. Right. Like ho- hopefully they kind of have this uh, a bit under control. I think it's it, it's more headline grabbing than it is actual worry. I don't know. I heard the NSA cancel their New York Times subscription like everyone else, but who knows? Um, there's another point of concern that came up in a headline as well. This could be another headline grabber as well. It's about, com- com- oh my God, I'm losing my English here. Quantum computing. Um, I've I've actually been reading up on quantum computing, and it's kind of exciting, like the the whole prospects of what it can do. But something I didn't think about was that there's now consider considerations that these could be so powerful in the advancement of these quantum computers that they could start disrupting security of things like blockchain, which is utilized by Bitcoin. So, you know, Bitcoin, while technically, as far as we're aware, hasn't actually been hacked. Um, the security could be uh, the, the yeah. compromised by these new computers and what they can do. Yeah, and so I, I kind of go with a, a little bit of, of the comments I made on our on our previous uh, story, right? Headline Which, grabber. Has, well, it's not so much a headline grabber. Look, this is a question that I've gotten since I started teaching courses about crypto and Bitcoin in, in 2020. And that is, well... You know, the, the Bitcoin network is so safe because you have these miners that are just running crazy hundreds of trillions of dollars transac- or, or of transactions every second, right? To to try to um to, to try to move the to try to mine Bitcoin and try to move the, the Bitcoin network forward, right? Hundreds of trillions of transactions per second that they're doing. And someone will always say, well, what about quantum computers? Can't quantum computers work so fast that they can actually essentially take over the Bitcoin network? And my response to that is uh, most likely they could. However, we've been talking about quantum computing for like 20 years and it hasn't happened yet. We, We haven't seen it yet. I have to imagine that it's not something that all of a sudden some guy is going to come out and announce. I've, inve- I, I've invented the quantum computer. No one knew it was coming. No one saw this, you know, like some company or, or whatever out of thin air. There are leaks all the time. There's no way that someone's just going to all of a sudden come up with a quantum computer and release it on everybody. And we're not going to have seen it coming, which to me means that Bitcoin miners are going to have seen it coming and they're going to adjust for it. And adjusting for it means the companies that produce Bitcoin miners are just going to include the quantum computing into it. And so if you have quantum computers trying to break Bitcoin and quantum computers managing the network, it's no different than what we have today. 
right? So, so I feel like they will be on equal footing. The other thing I'll say about this many, and, and look, if someone did, if, if a company came out, if IBM or Microsoft or, or Google or whomever said, we've, you know, we have this quantum computer at just out of the blue, right? Then yes, there is the theoretical chance that it, it could break Bitcoin, I guess. The other thing I'll say is if someone does develop it, it will more than likely be government related. And there are many more important things they can do with that than try to break Bitcoin, right? That's probably so far down the totem pole, as, as we said, based on the market cap and everything else. Why not go for NASDAQ or something, right? There's trillions of dollars there. You're going to go for Bitcoin. And if they were to hack or, or whatever, Bitcoin is the point to break Bitcoin, break the network just to do it. Or is a point to try to drain money out. And if you're trying to drain money out and we see it coming, the, the value just goes to zero and what whatever you've accumulated is, is worth nothing anymore. So part of the incentive mechanism behind the cryptocurrency Bitcoin says that if that were to, to come about, this quantum computing revolution that comes literally out of nowhere and breaks it, the value goes to zero. So there's no financial benefit in doing that, unless of course you're, you know, the creator of Bitcoin cash or something and you go, well, I want Bitcoin to die and I want mine to, to survive. But um, I think if, if quantum computing comes about, there are bigger fish to fry than Bitcoin. All right. So we, I, I, I'm with you. I call for a quantum computing stalemate in the world between good and evil. So, uh, you know, we'll see how all of this pans out over the next couple of hundred years. Probably won't see it, but uh, yeah. well, we'll hear about it one day read about it future generations we'll see so let's move on to something one of our favorite topics taxes um the ir <laughs> the irs has actually been on top of their game to a larger degree than the sec at least uh, on how they're looking at smart items in the crypto world coinbase is now highlighted a couple of issues in what uh, the irs is proposing as well why don't you talk us through these because you have your ria hat and you are an expert on all things taxes no, I know. I'm just running out of there because you know more than I do. So, not an expert on taxes at all. But but <laughs> Coinbase is concerned, and, and this this goes along with so much of what we've kind of seen in the government with this idea of we're going to we're so worried about people utilizing crypto to either evade taxes or to finance crime or terrorism. That that seems to be the biggest worry, and therefore we're going to put onerous restrictions on exchanges, whatever we consider to be ex an exchange. This is me talking as the government, by the way. Uh, we're going to put onerous restrictions on exchanges. We're going to put onerous reporting requirements that we wouldn't even have on, you know, traditional financial companies like banks or, or, or like, you know, traditional finance exchanges. We're going to put all these restrictions on and all these reporting requirements that one are, are usually not even viable. And two, in, in this case, actually, is handing over more information to the IRS than we would usually hand over for you know traditional transactions for banking transactions or anything else when the irony is cryptocurrency is so much is so much more transparent and traceable that it seems like the the government could do much of it on their own right it it seems you know a lot easier so why are we asking these exchanges to go through all this in this reporting to hand over even more information to the IRS than they have in, in any other uh, in any other traditional finance setting. And I think that's what partially what Coinbase is having an issue with. And also for Coinbase, it means they're going to have to you know hire more people and have more technology and hand over a lot of information that you and I don't don't necessarily want the IRS to have right now. And it's not that you and I are trying to evade paying taxes. It's that Look, you you as the government have, you know, you need certain information about me. You don't need every bit of information about me. And we got to draw the line somewhere. And Coinbase has been pretty good at going, here's where we're drawing the line and we're going to fight it. I like it. Need someone fighting our fight. Um, while I've just uh, dismissed the, the SEC on their speed on trying to get things done, um, someone who's kind of stepping into a little spotlight here is Governor Newsom of California. He's uh, greenlit some uh, crypto regulation, a crypto regulation bill for 2025, which is around the corner. And the bill will mandate cryptocurrency firms to adhere to licensing requirements, maintain financial records, provide regulators with the authority to conduct audits and, and you know, all those types of basic fundamental things. It, it almost reads like he's cut and pasted from the weed one 
to the crypto one with these kind of basic you know rules of engagement of doing business in 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 the real world right and you know and and it's funny that it's in crypto because obviously financial records are one that the strength and foundation blocks of crypto transactions so you know what do you think is this a is this another headline grabber for newsom i i don't well i i think it's newsom doing what newsom does which is we're going to you know put certain rules in place to to yes to get headlines to look like we're doing something and in reality not really understanding what the what the technology does or what what this ecosystem does and the fact that you're again requiring more reporting and and more regulations around this when th- this information is out there it's transparent anyway just the government can hire someone build the tech and go see what's going on if they want to uh, what it's also going to do, Matty, because I, I know there is a registration process that co- firms are going to have to go through to do business in California based on this rule. And just like we saw and we've seen in New York with their bit license, you're going to see people move out of the state or or move their companies elsewhere mm-hmm. outside of California because they don't want to do business there. And the, the people in California are likely going to start losing crypto related services because companies don't want to pay more money and comply with this. They don't need more regulation. They're getting enough issues about regulation on a federal level. They don't need to do it also on a state by state level. Right now, Governor Newsom and, and the uh, the powers that be and the regulators in California have said, look, we're just doing this in accordance with the money transmitter laws we already have. And we're making sure that crypto firms actually uh, adhere to those rules. And so, you know, my answer to that is, Go okay. You already have the rules. Why, why do you need more? Why do you need to enforce more regulation and make people pay for a license when, in reality, that you, all you're doing is you're causing barriers to entry for companies to operate in your state? Call me old fashioned, but it might be a, a money grab situation. <laughs> I, 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 I have a funny feeling that that's a big part of it. Look, that was a big part of it in New York as well. Yeah. Why not? Listen, why do you think weed's legal? legal? I saw yeah. a stat that this eighty-three million dollars was spent on uh, legalized marijuana in New York this year. So, yeah, well, that seems low. It, well, I said that's, legal. that's the legal right. side, right? So right. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. You know, these numbers get inflated, inflate year over year. But yeah, you know, why not? Why not clip your coupon on taxes on something like that? Yeah, I look. They, they're going to find the money wherever they can. Exactly. All adds up. So. Let's end with a couple of cool uh, application stories um, and some big names being thrown around here as well. Fidelity being one of them. Fidelity Digital Assets has become uh, the first enterprise client of EY. I guess that's the old Ernst & Young, latest generation blockchain analyzer. Um, it's a reconciler product and it's available via EY's blockchain SaaS platform. So we're kind of making um, leaps and bounds in this world with this. Right. And so we, you and I were just talking about the transparency of the data in, on, on public blockchains. And so now EY has said, look, we're going to be able to analyze and look at the data from these public blockchains. We built a tool for it. And Fidelity, of course, has come in and said, we want to use your tool. Because like, like I was talking about the government, the government could very easily build these tools. The government could be a, a user of this EY tool that they built, but it allows you to go look at all the, the transactions on chain and then go analyze it. And sometimes it's from an accounting perspective. What were the, what was the income? What were the expenses? How do we take what's happening on a blockchain and translate it into what we know about balance sheets? But it's also being able to look at transactions. And, and probably if you were on a you know kind of a government level or or the level of fidelity that has to do some sort of AML work, we can go. All right, if if someone is suspicious, are we able to look at their transaction history and determine? where this money originally came from. And if they know those people, because we Fidelity don't want to be uh, in in bed with, you know, we don't want to have clients that are moving terrorist money or criminal money or anything, we can use this tool to ferret that out. And then maybe we don't have to give, we won't have to give all of our information over to the government. We're going to do the work. And remember, Fidelity is also custodying Bitcoin and ETH now for clients. So they want to make sure that all their clients that are doing this are on the up and up, like the, the money that they have coming in is actually from legitimate people, legitimate sources and such. And if not, if there's anything sketchy, they're going to be able to investigate relatively quickly, which again, is kind of what the government should be doing 
rather than putting onerous reporting and, and regulations on these companies. It's again another one of those fights against those stupid arguments that crypto is only used for nefarious reasons by drug dealers and arms mm -hmm. dealers and such. It's about as transparent as it can be. And if you have the right tools and you know how to look at it, it's, it's phenomenal. So hopefully the government starts getting on the same page, but Fidelity and some of these big asset managers and other businesses are actually doing the right thing. So good for them. Stay on it, Fidelity. Keep on, keep on trucking. Um, one to wrap up for you, my friend. Uh, you might know a little bit something about the RIA universe, but uh, BitGo has acquired Height Zero to bring the preeminent global wealth management platform to RIAs. Talk us through this one. Yeah, I I love this. So I've I've known you know a bunch of people at BitGo for a long time. I know Luke over there, who's who's working in in the, been working in this realm for a while. Uh, Sean Waters and AJ Neri, who started Height Zero and have been building it for a while. And Height Zero is a platform that allows uh, financial advisors, RIAs in, in this case, to be able to manage client crypto assets, to be able to create what we call separately managed accounts. So you have an account, I have an account, your Bitcoin isn't the same as my Bitcoin, you know, your, it's segregated. Height Zero built this platform to allow the financial advisor to have several clients, several accounts. And BitGo is one of their main custodians. So Bitcoin is Bit, uh, BitGo is actually holding the crypto assets. So now BitGo has acquired Height Zero, so that they can have this uh, the, the, this financial platform, such that RIAs, financial advisors, can utilize it and manage client crypto assets. So you and I have obviously been talking almost nonstop about the the potential for a Bitcoin spot ETF and later an ETH spot ETF. And what we think will happen is there will be a tremendous amount of inflows to those ETFs, but then both clients, you know, investors and advisors will realize, oh, I can actually own the asset outright. I don't have to own the ETF, the wrapper with all the fees. I can go own the asset outright. And that's where Height Zero is going to fit in for RIA. So congrats to, you know, to Sean and AJ and to, and to Luke over at BitGo who uh, finally got this done. I know they've been talking about it for a while. So I'm glad to see this because I think after the ETF, more financial advisors are hopefully going to get educated and start actually, you know, managing client crypto assets in in you know different kinds of accounts than just putting them into spot ETFs. Well, that sounds great. So no commingling of funds, something that uh, FTX and Alameda could have done with a lesson in. So if only they'd known these guys as well. But Adam. Thank you, as always, for sharing your thoughts uh, on digital assets and uh, crypto. All right. Thanks for having me again, Matty. And obviously, you know, you seem to know quite a lot about this stuff. So uh, if someone wants to learn a bit more and uh, maybe uh, an RIA or two who wants to educate their clients better, um, what can they do? Oh, I know. They can come and check out Adam's course on interaxis.io. The link's down there. So make sure you check it out and earn yourself a course in digital assets and crypto education. So uh, feel free to do that. And of course, don't forget to sign up to your finance TV. Stay on top of everything. Until next time, thank you for watching. And of course, good luck investing.